that leaves me nicely on to Belton. Um, so obviously divided is addressing medical racism, but in order to do that, you had to unpick the mm. concept of race itself. Why was it for you vital to focus on a figure like Francis Galton when you were trying to get people, readers of this book, to understand how race is constructed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for people that have read, you know, some of the opening chapters already, they'll have context about Francis Galton, but essentially he was what people call a polymath. He was a statistician, he was a biologist, he was, you know, an explorer. Um, he was doing lots and lots of things. And um, he started the Eugenics Institute at UCL, um, and then um, that was carried on by his protege, Carl Pearson. And we now know, you know, eugenics spread across the world um, to, and had huge influence in terms of the policies in the US, in terms of segregation, um, apartheid in South Africa. Um, it's had huge implications and a lot of people are still proponents of eugenics now, um, although the, the, the words become really taboo, um, really un, their underpinning ideology is that some people are just inherently inferior um, and actually we would be better off without them. And the reason I focused on uh, that journey is because very much learning about Galton was really foundational, really, to my own journey mm -hmm. to starting to look at race science and unpick that more. Um, so in terms of my own specialty, sexual reproductive health, um, I started talking and looking at the history and the legacy of family planning and how we talk about it today. And um, Family planning, and which was then called, but people still use that term, um, and contraception development. Yes, it was very focused on you know women's rights at the time and that movement um, and giving people autonomy over their bodies. But it was not really paid attention to until people realised the eugenic potential mm. of developing contraception, right? Because before that, there you know there'd been forced sterilizations of lots of people disabled people, uh, people with mental health issues, uh, black and brown communities. But then contraception has also changed that because now if you can develop, you know, jabs or, you know, tablets or other things, then you can give those to people to reduce their, their them producing as well. So there was heavy investment um, from eugenesis in the family planning movement um, and proponents of family planning, which there's been greater discussion about their ties to eugenics like Mary Stokes in the mm. UK and their thoughts um, around eugenics and how that shaped the movement. So I had to uh, look at Galton's legacy because it was actually kind of an entry point for me of starting to understand how um, you know race science governs where we are now um, and so many overlapping interests um, in terms of looking how uh, ideas like eugenics spring mm. in the UK and actually how they have so much influence elsewhere and how that continues to happen. And I talk about that a bit more in terms of what scientific imperialism is, what that does and things mm -hmm. like that. How did it feel to investigate Galton and how strongly he was tied to your alma mater, like UCL? Yeah. And realised that UCL had funded for many, many years a eugenics department that was dedicated to this idea of being able to breed the ultimate race, which is ridiculous because biologically, right, there's only one race, the human mm. race. And we're talking about this idea of ethnicity, we're talking about something completely different. How did that feel to like uncover the extent of Galton's funding? So I always say that in terms of writing this book, actually, I found it really cathartic um, because although his legacy is so troubling and I talk about how, you know, airy it felt to go and look at what is now called the eugenics collection, it's quite a small collection at UCL. Um, it used to be called the Galton Collection of all his objects in terms of uh, what he was doing to measure people and all those uh, instruments he used as part of the Eugenics Institute and other parts of his work. Although it felt, you know, quite unsettling, it was really cathartic to fill in the blanks in terms of my own learning and see things that I'd read about. You know, so I talk about the, the Martin's Eye Scale, which he used in experiments um, on, you know, Jewish children in East London, um, and Pearson used that. So, um, you know, trying to draw some of these ideas about, you know, intellect and what race was and um, trying to make these things measurable. It was nice to see, it wasn't nice to see them, but it was good to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, it felt good being able to um, have a more comprehensive understanding. 
that I feel that lots of us are denied um, in terms of our own experiences, what it means to be uh, black in Britain and be part of the diaspora. Um, I think in terms of it being something that was at my uh, a university that I, I went to and um, I talk about my own experiences there as well um, in, the, in the chapter on education and how uh, it can feel as a black student in, in academia. Um, I felt that, you know, much more needs to be done in terms of tying some of this, um, these legacies to using it to open up conversations about where we are now. And this is what I'm trying to do in the book, right? So in a way, I felt like, isn't it a shame that actually you have this whole collection here? You have um, these lecture theatres named after people like Galton. And because of part fear, part denial, people don't want to use these things as teachable moments and tools, right? Um, which is what we should be doing right um because it's completely different to have a discussion for example around a book but then go and look at some of these objects and see concrete evidence mm. of these ways of thinking you know and i think we appreciate a lot the um how obviously museums and we can talk about you know museum board and all this thing, but how seeing things mm. right and preserving horrible things though can sometimes provide real impetus to push conversations forward um so the fact that these a lot of these objects were dusty in a box in a skip right um before someone came along to decide to uncover them and contextualize them tells you a lot right um, people don't want to have these discussions because the, seeing them is powerful. Mm. I, I totally agree. It's there's something very anchoring that brings history into the pre present day when you can see an object in front of you and you realise and it's battered and you realise people have touched it, they've used it, this has been something that is lived through. Um, and the sort of horrible histories attached to that, we do need to uncover them. Um, something really interesting that you talk about in the book is what I've started calling medical amnesia, which is where, for example, in the plantation era particularly, you had Western scientists, doctors, etc., who would erase existing knowledge mm -hmm. by indigenous communities, enslaved communities, and also knowledge that had come from the Middle East many, many years before, because we know there was such a healthy medical tradition in um, sort of pre well, it would be modern, no, early modern, uh, in sort of like the ancient era, um, in in what they now call sort of Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. um, and I was fascinated, what does this do to our understanding of where medical discoveries come from? And then who gets dominion over this idea of medicine and the invention of medicine and innovation in that space? Yeah, absolutely. So this, um, so I have a chapter called Whitewashed and um, I think that in many ways was one of the more challenging chapters and um, you know I'm not a historian I've used and um, cited lots of the work of brilliant historians that have brought some of these stories forward and contextualize it within my medical um, practice and um, I'm thankful to you know the people that trawl the archives and have done some of that some of that really um, harder work but even just piecing together my understanding of like where ideas come from what it means was really difficult and I found it really frustrating and really upsetting because ultimately history has been written by a few right and the things that people don't want to, you to know are very hard to get to you know um, there was stories that broke or you know uncovered and uh, uh, in articles a few years ago about how many documents were burnt in when the British Empire was like falling and just got rid of and we'll never know be able to know what was in them and filling those gaps so yeah when it comes to our understanding of science and contributions we're really beholden to the people that held the pen um, and the enslaved and the oppressed people a lot of those here um, those histories actually um, were oral histories like Yoruba history mm -hmm. um, I'm with Nigerian Yoruba descent it's very oral so um, when those when, when people are you know transported people not speaking the same tongue a lot of those ideas and concepts are lost right so I think we also have to um, say that there's lots of things that we don't know about contributions, but there are tidbits within um, 
those that are a bit more honest about their scientific developments of saying, actually, I uh, learnt this from the indigenous population or I followed their practices and um, that, that um, led me to understand that this, you know, um, plant or this, um, this practice was, um, you know, useful for us to, to develop. So I put forward the argument that essentially we often think of like Western medicine as like white endeavour project, mostly by like white men. But it's actually more complex than that, especially when we look at the history of European colonisation and travel and them studying communities, bringing things back, looking at things. Um, and I think that expanding that area of understanding would actually encourage a lot more people to engage. And I think one of the areas I think this is quite key is probably around vaccination. So I use the example of the history of kind of inoculation, um, which is the idea of like injecting um, some of a disease to build immunity and how actually that was practiced for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? But the idea we've really reduced kind of the legacy of that to Edward Jenner, you know, and the eradication of like smallpox, right? Which is really obviously huge moment and contribution in science mm. but often people just have no kind of context or backstory before that and it's very unhelpful because then what people do is they're like oh well this is like a white western thing um all the other kind of uh black and brown communities globally were just sitting there getting disease mm. uh not practicing any kind of scientific thought you know and people can say oh no that's an outlandish claim but I see videos like this all the time on social media, you know, circulating, like without um, the contributions of white people, all of you lot would just be kind of dying in, in the tropics, right? Which is like very far, you know, removed from what was actually happening. But we only have so much understanding about what was happening because of the house history has been eclipsed essentially and lost. And also the other the other side of that is taking those histories away from you know populations and demographics who had that medical knowledge makes them more mistrustful of that idea of you know this white western medicine yeah absolutely and that's um one of the things why i'm so passionate about like uncovering um you know some of the other health practices that have existed you know for hundreds or even thousands of years and telling those stories and contextualizing those stories and why we need to discuss uh that more because what it does is it does breed this distrust and um i do think that when you look um at black diaspora communities there is this real um surge and cling to you know what people consider like natural based medicines because people consider uh you know our medical institutions and spaces like as white oppressive medicine right which obviously i unpack more in the book and obviously through histories that i've told and forced experimentation has a clear basis in truth but it's also far more complex than that because there have been things that have been um, contributed by um, in enslaved and indigenous people along the way to those institutions to allow them to flourish and exist, right? Um, and I think we do need to uh, fight that with facts and understanding and uh, storytelling.